supposed to be preaching this morning. Or we go, ah, what have you missed? It's supposed to be Rosia, um, my friend Rosia. Um, but Rosia has really been struggling with his health for a month or so, and uh, on Thursday, I think it was, or Wednesday, uh, he was readmitted back into Whips Cross Hospital where he's been quite a bit over the last uh, month or so. Uh, and uh, he's back there really, he hasn't had an operation so far and they're really struggling to really work out uh, how to treat uh, him uh, and his physical needs at the moment. So uh, I'm just going to pray for his ear this morning. I, I spoke to him Friday and, you know, he said, I'm so sorry not to be there, but let's just commit him to God in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for his ear. Thank you. I thank you for his friendship through so many years and, Lord, for his uh, work in Canning Town and his ministry in this place. And, Lord, we just pray for him this morning in Whips Cross and ask that he will have a tremendous sense of you being with him and we pray for the doctors and nurses as they care for him and seek to uh, really get to grips with his physical needs. And Lord, we just pray you will give them wisdom. And in the days to come, they will just be able to really establish uh, what treatment he needs, uh, that he might just be restored to full health and strength. Lord, we just commit him and Maria to you at this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, some, uh, here are some prayers that uh, children wrote. Dear God, instead of letting people die and having new ones, why don't you just keep the old ones you have? That's quite an interesting point. It's quite profound when you think about that. Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works with my brother and me. Dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love everybody in the whole world. There are four people in my family and I can't do it. <laughs> Dear God, in school they told us what you do. Who does it when you are on holiday? Dear God, are you really invisible or is it just a trick? That's actually a really profound question too. Dear God, did you mean for a giraffe to look like that, or was it just an accident? Dear God, thank you for my baby brother, but what I prayed for was a puppy. <laughs> there you go. So, we're in Acts chapter 2. If you've got a Bible, you'll, you'll find it helpful to have one. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. And verse 42 because this is our theme for the year, our theme passage for the year as a church. We've been focusing on it. We want to be like it. And so through this year, we began the year thinking about uh, the call to worship and praise that these verses are and the kind of joyful life that we are to live. We thought about the fellowship that we're called to have with each other, that togetherness and that belonging. We thought about the signs and wonders, about God being at work in our midst. We thought about the apostles' teaching. And Miles McBean came and uh, began our thinking around the Bible and what that really is and uh, what it uh, is for. And of course, that's why we are again looking at the Bible this morning. Because the purpose of this book is that it might change us. And so we come again to this passage this morning because there's at least one important area of our life as a church and as Christians that we haven't yet tackled through this year. Verse 42 says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So this morning we're looking at prayer. Prayer. 
they devoted themselves to prayer. Now, let me say right here and now a few things. Firstly, I am not an expert about prayer. This isn't about what I do and me saying, copy me. This is about what God's Word says. Secondly, let me say I'm, it's not my wish and desire to make you or me feel guilty as we look at prayer, but we'll look at what God's Word says. And thirdly, let me say, you may feel that we don't end up, you don't end up learning anything new, hearing anything new, that you haven't heard before, but we're going to look at what God's Word says. So, devoted to prayer. What does this devoted to prayer life look like? The first thing to say about it is that it, is, it involves dedicated time. Dedicated time. I was chatting with someone yesterday because I noticed that they had a, a nasty cut on their knee. And uh, I said, oh, how did you do that? And they said, oh, I was doing too many things at once. I was walking along on the phone doing this. I was late going there. And I was thinking about that. And I just fell over. And that's us, isn't it, in life? We do so many things. We multitask. We're trying to do all these things. I believe that prayer is not part of multitasking. Prayer is a solo task. Prayer is something we have to give dedicated time to. Let's see how that is demonstrated in Scripture. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1, if you want to. These are just single verses, so you don't need to turn because I'll read, them t uh, read the whole verses anyway. But um, I'm going to turn to Mark 1 and verse 35, where it says this. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Well, there we are. It's very clear, isn't it? It's still dark. So it's significantly before six o'clock in Israel terms in the morning. And Jesus gets up, goes out, finds a, solit a solitary place, somewhere he'd be on his own without the disciples, and there we read that he prayed. If we go into Luke's Gospel, which is where the rest of the verses we're going to look at, are Luke 3, verse 21, we read this. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too, and as he was praying, heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. I don't think I've realized that before, that when Jesus was baptized, he went through the water, he was baptized, he came... And he was praying. That's what Jesus was doing. Okay? In the process of his baptism. And then the Holy Spirit came down on him. And obviously the disciples saw this. They saw him praying. Not just seeing the dove coming down. But they visibly observed Jesus praying uh, through his baptism. Chapter 5. Verse 16 reads as follows. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Often. This was the pattern in Jesus' life. He needed often to find a place on his own, away from the disciples even, and to pray. As the Son of God, Jesus did this. Chapter 6, verse 12 one of these days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray, there's an example of one of those occasions, and spent the night praying to God. And when morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he designated as apostles. So before this, you know, absolutely critical, crucial point where... Uh, the twelve are chosen, 
Jesus spends the night on a, beforehand on a mountainside praying. That's what you find him doing. That's how important it was to him about this decision. So that's what he does to reflect that. He spends that night on the mountainside. Chapter 9, verse 28, we read as follows. About eight days later, after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. And then there follows the, the transfiguration uh, event. But the, what Jesus did, <laughs> and what he took Peter, James, and John with him, was about praying. They went up this mountain to pray. And the transfiguration is something that happened as Jesus was praying. In the sense, interrupting, and indeed it says, doesn't it, verse 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. So this tremendous, marvellous event where then Moses and Elijah appear and so on is, is actually it was preceded by Jesus praying. Chapter 11, verse 1 says this, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So things have got to the point now where the disciples realise how important prayer was to Jesus and that they hadn't, didn't understand it. I guess they, yeah, it, Jesus' praying was something just very, very different from what they'd experienced, I guess, growing up as a Jew. And therefore, it was Jesus, you know, the inference of this, isn't it, is Jesus, teach us to pray as you pray. Teach us to know prayer as important to ourselves as you know it, as important to you, Jesus. Teach us that, we pray. Chapter 22. We're not looking at every occasion by a long shot. Chapter 22, verse 39. It says this, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. And on reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. This is the Garden of Gethsemane. So, you know, we, we, we can't, in truth, you pretty well could go through and you would get, at least on every double page in your Bible, a reference to Jesus praying. And almost to prove that's true, if you turn over one double page and look in chapter 23 and verse 34... Jesus is now on the cross. And his first words on the cross are, verse 34, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. His first words on the cross are a prayer. And his last words on the cross, that's verse 46, isn't it? Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Wow. Wow how important prayer was to Jesus in his earthly life. In a sense, need I say more? <laughs> you know, if as the Son of God come down here into human form, he needed to pray like that, with that kind of commitment and dedication Praying, 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 praying here. Making time to pray. Constantly making time to pray. Then need I say more? Well, once Jesus had ascended into heaven, what did his, uh, the twelve apostles do? Acts chapter 1. tells us that after he ascended, they went back to Jerusalem, and verse 14 says, they all joined together constantly in prayer. 
along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Wow, Jesus had taught them well, hadn't he? They got it. They got it. They knew. Because Jesus didn't say to them, you go back and pray together. There's no reference to that at all. He just said, well, you go back there, you wait. But what they decided to do, when they were together there, in this period before the Spirit came, was to pray together. Constantly. They met and prayed together. Verse 23, same chapter. So they proposed, there was the issue about what to do about the fact there was now 11 of them because Judas had died, committed suicide. And so they proposed two men, verse 23 says, Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. And then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. They prayed when they wanted to choose the right person. They prayed before they chose the new 12th apostle. And so, of course, although I accept that verse 1 of chapter 2 does not, uh, what it says is, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. What do you think they would do? I know it doesn't say they were praying, but what do you think they were doing? I'm sure they were praying in that, together, in that place, because that's what they did when they came together. And then, of course, the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And therefore, when we come to verse 42 of chapter 2, they devoted themselves to prayer... It's a continuation of what Jesus had done, of what they had started to do in that short time since Jesus had left them. And now then, as the early church and those first Christians, they carried on praying together. They prayed, they prayed, they prayed together. And so chapter 3, verse 1, one day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon, and what do you think they were going to do in the temple? Of course they were going to pray. That's what everyone was doing who was going, the crowds who were going to the temple. The only reason for going, they were going to pray in the temple. That's what they were doing. And so we could, but time does not allow us to go on through Acts and see how prayer was an essential core part of the life of those first Christians. So the first point I want to make is that prayer if we're going to be this kind of person, this kind of Christian, if we're going to devote ourselves to prayer, we have to have dedicated time to do it. We need to set a time aside to do it and to be regular about that. Whether that's the first thing before we get up, uh, when we, before we get up, after we wake, before we get up, or we have breakfast after breakfast, whether it's a point in the evening, don't make it too late because we get too tired, but we need to find and have dedicated time to pray. That's what being devoted to prayer looks like. Secondly, being devoted to prayer looks, uh, is about praying on our own and praying together. We've seen that in all those verses. Jesus so often went to pray on his own, but not exclusively so. Because we don't then have any of those prayers recorded. But there were the other times when he prayed together, with whether it was James, John, uh, Peter, or others. And then we've seen in the early church, they came together to pray. And we need both. We need to pray on our own and we need to pray together. And that's why as a church we make those opportunities. When we come together on a Sunday, uh, on Wednesdays when we meet, we spend time praying. Once a month we meet here on a Friday specifically uh, to focus on praying. We come together to pray. You see, Jesus said, where two or three of you meet together in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Jesus is with us, and therefore we can talk to him. I know in a busy life it's hard to find time to pray. I've never forgotten the example of someone called Susanna Wesley. Susanna Wesley was the mother of John Wesley. John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church what became the Methodist Church, yeah? And uh, she had another son called Charles Wesley who wrote thousands, literally thousands of hymns. In fact, she had 19 children, did uh, Susanna Wesley. Um, they weren't all children at the same time, if you think about that, okay? And some of them didn't reach adulthood. Um, but Susanna Wesley, you know, therefore had a very, very busy home, a very busy home, okay? <laughs> one thought it was busy at home with three 
imagine, you know, all those kids, eh? Uh, or, you know, a lot of those kids, they're at home. And yet she and her husband, you know, produced, spiritually produced John Wesley <laughs> and Charles Wesley, you know, and, and some of the other sons as well uh, went on to do very significant things in turning round and bringing revival to this country in the late 1700s. And how did she, what is her, how did she make time to pray? What her children say, said, uh, is that they knew their mother was praying and she was not to be interrupted. But when she took her outer skirts, because she had a petticoat underneath, she sat in a chair, she took her outer skirt, she lifted that up and put that over her head. Uh, and that was when she was praying. And you, they didn't interrupt their, their mother because she prayed. And that's how she found, you know, in a, obviously a tiny little home, uh, somewhere in the Midlands, wasn't it? They, Northampton, I think, area they lived. Uh, how she find the time to pray. Pray for her ch children. Pray for all sorts of things. But she was so determined. There was nowhere she could go. So she pulled up her uh, outer skirt and put that over her head and her children knew not to interrupt her. So, you know, she could do it with 17, sorry, 19 children. Did I say something? She had 19, because it included plus John and Charles, 17 plus John and Charles. Um, we, we need to be people who pray alone and we pray together. That's part of being devoted to prayer. Thirdly, being devoted to prayer involves commitment. Do you think it was easy for Jesus to get up in the dark and go out? Don't think because he was the son of God it was easy. He, wasn't, he was human. He was human, okay, at this point. He had human characteristics. So I'm absolutely sure that it was, not, it was just as difficult for him to get up before dark and go out and pray as it would be for you and I. But that's what he did, because that's how important prayer was to him. Now, if we're totally honest, most of us as Christians would put prayer into the difficult box. You know, we'd say it's one of the hard things, tough things about being a Christian. And so we need to be committed to it. You know, we need to be devoted to it, dedicated to it. Otherwise, it will not happen. And we will miss out on the wonderful benefits of prayer. So we need to stick at it with praying. You know, we need to persevere with it. We need to make it at times, well, it needs to just be a matter of our commitment in our lives that we pray. And fourthly, the fourth characteristic, I think, of being devoted to prayer is, of course, prayer is an expression of our relationship with God. When we become a, one of God's children, we receive his grace and mercy. We know his forgiveness in our lives. We do become his child, as we thought about a bit last week. You know, We, 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 we are able, he becomes our heavenly father. We can call him Father. We have a new life in a new family. It would be extraordinary and it would be a matter of significant concern if we had a child who was growing up and the child, whilst able to speak, never spoke to us as the parent. How peculiar that would be. How peculiar. And yet, of course, that's the, you know, the real, this is the reality. We are in God's family. We talk to each other, and we need to talk to him. So that Jesus said to his disciples, when they asked how should we pray, Jesus said to them, you pray saying, our Father, our Father. Prayer is talking with God, my heavenly Father. I was blessed with a wonderful earthly Father. I found it easy to talk to him. I guess most of us were in that position. Well, it certainly is no harder to talk to God than our earthly father. And in fact, it's even easier. Because he's always, of course, he's always with us here in the present, listening. Paul writing to the Romans says, at times you'll find you don't really quite know the words to say. And you may just be able to say, Dad, Abba. Which just means a simple dad. 
when you're struggling for words in prayer. That's fine. That's fine. But talk, talk to your Heavenly Father. Talk to Him. Be devoted in prayer. So I'd like us, just for a few minutes lastly, to look at the first prayer that we have recorded in the life of the new Christians. And that's in chapter 4 of Acts. The context of chapter 4 is that in chapter 3, Peter and John had healed the man at the uh, temple gate, and they'd been arrested and taken off to the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, which Nicodemus was part, of course, and they had been... Uh, they were, uh, there was no specific charge that they could really lay against them, but they were being threatened and so on. Um, and in verse 18 of chapter 4, we read this. Then they called them in again, this is the ruling council, called in Peter and John and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God, for we cannot help but speaking about what we have seen and heard. Further after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them, because all the people were praising God for all that had happened. For the man who had, was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Verse 23, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and why the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant David, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will has deci had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And after they had prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Three, essentially, their prayer here can guide us in our prayers. There are three sort of parts to their prayer, really. The first part to their prayer begins right at the beginning, which is right where it should begin. They begin the prayer by saying, in verse 24, Sovereign Lord, you made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them. They began by acknowledging who God is. The God before whom they were coming. Yes, our Father, but a God who is a great God. An extraordinary God. An indescribable God. We've sung some great songs this morning about you know, how extraordinary God is. Running out of words to describe Him. And that is right that we do that when we come together and when we pray. Similarly, if at all possible, we should begin our praying recognizing who God is and how great he is. It's not that God needs to be reminded. We're the ones who need to remember and allow it to be soak into our hearts and minds again about how great God is. So that's why they begin in that way. And then they, begin, they go on, say, you spoke by your Holy Spirit, David, and they, they refer to some scriptures uh, a, a psalm and so on, and describes some events that have happened so far. And that's absolutely right too, isn't it? They see the relevance of Scripture to their situation and to the difficulties that they're encountering. And it's great, and that's one of the reasons, because we should know Scripture, because Scripture is always relevant to our situation, and the more we can use Scripture in our praying, the better because we see that what's happening to us isn't some kind of random event, but it's actually part of God's great plan, and that's what they're saying here. God, you were in control there. You said this, and then this happened, and this happened, but these things are all being part of your plan, they say. And that is right, that the events and circumstances in our lives are part of God's great plan. 
And we, need to, we should acknowledge that before God, that that's the case. Things aren't randomly happening to us. We have a God who is over all things, a God who is in control of all things, who is sovereign, ruler, king of kings, and lord of lords. And so they recognize who God is, they recount the relevance of Scripture and the way that they are part of God's work and God's plan. And then in verse 29, they say, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miracles and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. They come and ask God quite specifically about themselves and what they want to happen in their situation and in Jerusalem. And that's absolutely right, isn't it? That we, we do bring before God our specific requests, the things which matter to us, the things we want to happen in our lives and the lives of people around us. That's absolutely right we do that, and they do that in this prayer. They pray for great boldness, not just boldness. They say, give us great boldness to keep speaking the word. Interesting, they don't pray for the persecution to stop. They don't say, oh God, please don't let us get arrested again. Oh God, please take away those angry crowds. Please ch- convert. The, they didn't say, Lord, please convert the Sanhedrin. They don't, want, they don't ask for the persecution to stop. Just, Lord, make, keep us bold. Keep us being bold, great bold. And Lord, show your power. Send your power here in Jerusalem. Do great things in Jerusalem in the name of Jesus. What a tremendous prayer and requests they uh, make before God. And so, of course, we, well, I couldn't stop reading. We read the outcome of their prayer. It said in verse 31, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. I can't really explain that. Does that mean physically? Does that sort of mean emotionally? Does that mean them as people? Does that mean the... I don't know. That's what Scripture says. The place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. They'd been filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, but they were refilled with the Holy Spirit now. Brothers and sisters, dare I suggest that each time we come in this place, we need to be refilled with the Holy Spirit because we leak. And by imperfections and by our failings, we leak and we need the filling again of the Holy Spirit in our lives as they experienced at this point. And the verse finishes, and they spoke the word of God boldly. They spoke the word of God boldly. But God answered their prayer, didn't he? He answered their prayer and he said, yes, yes and yes. To the things they asked. Lord, I pray that my devotion might have the same outcome and impact as those early believers. Isn't that tremendous? What a marvelous picture of them being devoted to prayer. Peter and John come back from the time of oppression and threats. They all engage together in prayer. Recognize who God is. Say, God, this is part of your plan. Now, God, we need to do more for you. And God says amen to that. And fills them with his spirit and they go out and speak boldly. And great things are done there in Jerusalem as the church continues to go, grow. So, yeah, that's my prayer. Lord, may our devotion to prayer Be like those first Christians. Let's pray. Lord, I pray. I pray that, Lord, all of us here this morning might have a deep desire to walk with you in a life of prayer a life that's devoted to prayer, a life that's devoted to the relationship we have with you, Lord. You are not a distant God. You are not some wooden idol that we have to rant and rave about. Lord, you are the living God, the one who has shown yourself in Jesus 
and has entered into a relationship with us as our Heavenly Father. And we can come before you, Lord, at any time and pray. We thank you for the marvel of this ability that you've given us, of your openness to us to come to you. Forgive us, Lord, for our lack of devotion to prayer. But Lord, as we have reflected on the life of your son this morning and seen how prayer was so important to him, as we've reflected, Lord, upon the life of the early church and seen how prayer was so central to them, Lord, we want to also to be people who are devoted to prayer on our own, Lord, and together. That we will walk with you in this intensely close and personal relationship forever drawing closer to you and knowing you better. And that we might be useful in your service as we seek to speak for you and live for you. Lord, hear the desire of our hearts this morning, we pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill us again. Change us, mold us, Renew us, we pray, that we may walk close with you, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing a lovely song to close that is a prayer.